the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from A Perfumed Scorpion by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. 3. The Path and the Duties and Techniques Great publicly known Sufi teachers, those who can operate within all the concepts which might be necessary for comprehensive school work, are extremely rare, appearing about once in a generation. We see this if we look at the prominent ones of the past thousand years, and distinguish between such figures and those with merely local or keeping the tradition going competence. I have listed, in Tales of the Dervishes, only 45 of them in the last millennium, which is about one in a generation. The medieval dervish textbook Awarif al-Marif, The Gifts of Knowledge, which covers about seven centuries, gives about half as many, equivalent to one for every 44 years. And Aflaki, the biographer of Rumi, lists the first seven masters in Rumi's spiritual pedigree as living through just over two centuries, which makes one teacher every 30 years. Al-Ghazali, both revered by Christian divines of the Middle Ages and regarded as a standard Sufi authority since the 12th century, has codified, as it were, some of the characteristics of Sufi learning and teaching in a manner which has not been excelled. In his Revival of Religious Studies, an enormous tome not yet fully translated into English, he addresses the would-be student with the phrase, He who knows, and knows that he knows, follow him. The next three dicta in this vein, often distorted into popular jingles, are in reality precise, technical aphorisms, and he quotes them from Al-Khalil B. Ahmad, when he is referring to the teacher, whose duties are three. He who knows, but does not know that he knows, he is asleep, wake him. He who knows not, and knows that he knows not, he wishes to learn, teach him. He who knows not, and is ignorant that he does not know, reject him. The Sufi's competence does not extend to those whom the culture has still to affect to the limit of its own ability. Three Capacities, Ghazali Three Capacities, Ghazali continues, go with Sufi knowledge. 1. The power of extra perception, consciously extended. 2. The ability to move bodies outside their own mass. 3. The capacity to acquire, by direct awareness, knowledge otherwise obtained only through much labour. The duty of the teacher is, notes Ghazali in his Book of Wisdom, that he shall not withhold any advice needed by the student, neither may he allow him to try to reach any stage until he is able to master it, or to permit him to attempt anything intricate until he has perceived the simple things which precede it. You can't get very far with someone who takes a prayer book back to the bookshop because it doesn't work. He must make sure that the student realises that this knowledge cannot endure together with competitiveness, boasting, or a desire for power in respect to it. The protection of knowledge, affirms Ghazali, from those who might distort it, is more important than teaching itself and the operation of teachership is so important, as Aflaki notes, so vital that a learned man who does not act is effectively an ignoramus, or a munakib. There are many characteristics of the teacher noted by this standard author, but the duties of the student are those which tend to interest newcomers to this field. There are ten of them. The Ten Duties of the Student The first duty is that the student must make himself inwardly clean. This means that he must be able to operate without the distorting effects of anger, greed, envy, and so on, 
which are not really regarded by Sufis as human, but rather as pre-human. The second duty is to have worldly interests, but only to the extent that they are needed by the social environment. The watchword here is that knowledge gives nothing to a man until he gives everything to it. The third duty is of complete submission to the teacher. This is, of course, part of a contract of mutual and total respect. Ghazali illustrates this with a story about a time when the secretary of the Prophet Muhammad was about to mount a mule. Ibn Abbas, a member of the Prophet's family, came forward to hold the stirrup. The secretary said, O cousin of the Prophet, do not trouble yourself. Ibn Abbas answered, We have been commanded to treat thus the wise. Then the secretary kissed the hand of Ibn Abbas, saying, And we, too, have been commanded to revere the apostolic family. Knowledge cannot be attained except through humility. This relationship is quite different from the guruist submission system. The fourth duty is not to concern oneself with apparent differences in formulation and opinion of the various studies. The student must follow and acquire the form which is that of his teacher. The fifth duty is that the student should familiarise himself with ideas of laudable knowledge, apart from his own field. This is because knowledge is interrelated, and because ignorance of other branches of learning so often produces bigotry and scorn. The sixth duty is that the student should study whatever he is following in its due order. Sufi knowledge is the most advanced knowledge, it is noted here. It is quite different from mere repetition and assuming various beliefs handed down by one's predecessors. This is as true in religion as in anything else. The seventh duty is not to approach one part of study before that which comes before it has been completed. This is because each stage prepares for the next. This caution about doing things in the right succession can be illustrated by the tale of the illiterate peasant who learnt to read. Someone stopped him in the street and said, Well, friend, I suppose you're reading the Bible now. Bible? demanded the peasant indignantly. I got past that months ago. I'm on the horse racing results now. The eighth duty is to understand the relative ranking of the various studies. Inner development, for instance, is higher than those studies which do not deal in human durability. The ninth duty is that the aim should be self-improvement, not visible power or influence or disputation. Neither should one despise such external studies as are carried out by others, which might include law, literature and religious observances. The tenth duty is to know the connection between the various studies, so that one should not concentrate closely on relatively unimportant things at the expense of perhaps distant, though significant, ones. What is really significant is of real importance to the student. The Stations and the States Now we may turn to the exercises and the concepts which surround them. First of all, there is the station, called makam. This is the word for the quality which, at any given moment, the student is cultivating, under the instructions of his director. He may be expected to stabilise himself on, say, taubat, turning back, repentance, until his teacher assigns him to another developmental exercise. It is a posture, and so is termed an act. In one sense, it is a stage, a word which has also been used for it. But a stage is not a state. States are episodes of altered consciousness which come upon the individual without his being able to control them. The state is also known as a gift. The main objective of Sufis experiencing these flashes is to get beyond them. The eminent teacher Junaid of Baghdad emphasizes that states are like flashes of lightning. Their permanence is merely a suggestion of the lower self. This means that their filtering through the unaltered ego causes delusions. If they can be felt, 
and are valued instead of conducting to the stage of perceptual breakthrough, the student is in a rut. Being in one or other station is seen as a sort of necessary bondage, part of the training of the commanding self, and a time comes when this is no longer necessary. Similarly, the states indicate a contaminant in the person, who should instead, and eventually will, it is hoped, experience knowledge instead of intoxication or dazzle. The passage in Hujwiri's book, Revelation of the Veiled, the first one in Persian on Sufism, goes like this. All the teachers of this path are agreed that when a man has escaped from the captivity of stations and got away from the contamination of states and is liberated from the abode of change and decay, dependence upon time and place, and becomes endowed with praiseworthy qualities, he is disjoined from all qualities. That is to say, he is not held in bondage by any praiseworthy quality of his own, nor does he care about it, nor does it make him conceited. His state is hidden from the perception of intelligence, and his time is exempt from the influence of thoughts. The Sufi director knows by the behaviour of the student what the condition of his secondary, commanding self is at any given time. In countries where Sufi studies are full of prestige, and yet where only the circuses take on almost all comers as members, there is some pressure on real Sufis to accept disciples. Tale of the Amazing Experiences One joke about this is that of the would-be disciple who, full of what he had read in books and heard from the members of excitatory orders, went to talk of his experiences to a real Sufi. Master, he cried, I have had amazing experiences of a spiritual sort, which prove to me that I am destined to become an illuminated Sufi, and you must therefore take me on as a pupil. In fact, I already have students of my own. The Sufi smiled and said, Brother, forget all this talk of amazing experiences. The real candidates for self-realization are those who have felt nothing at all, or who do so no longer. Now, what was amazing about your experiences? The amazing thing is, said the dauntless applicant, that these were experiences in which I experienced absolutely nothing at all. This is the unaltered, commanding self in action though such behaviour usually takes place silently within the person and we don't often get opportunities of seeing it externalised as beautifully as this. Let us look at this part-conditioned, part-uncontrolled self in its various stages. The Conditions of the Human Self The self, called the nafs, goes through certain stages in Sufi development first existing as a mixture of physical reactions, conditioned behaviour and various subjective aspirations. The seven stages of the self constitute the transformation process, ending with the stage of perfection and clarification. Some have called this process the refinement of the ego. The stages are the commanding self, the accusing self, the inspired self, the tranquil self, the satisfied self, the satisfying self, the purified and completed self. Each one of the words given above signifies a major characteristic of the self in its upward ascent. Hence, in Sufi eyes, most people in all cultures are generally familiar only with the first stage of the self, as represented in their ethical systems as something which seeks only its own interests. The ordinary person, staying at the level of ordinary religious and moral teaching, is at the stage which the Sufis would regard as struggling with the commanding self, with, in action, the accusing self reproaching itself for its shortcomings. It is because of this scheme that observers have styled Sufi development as going five stages beyond that known to the ordinary moral person. It cannot be denied that in Sufi eyes the stages of human service, for instance, and concern for others, 
are regarded as not very great achievements, though lauded to the skies in moralistic-centred systems as almost impossible of attainment. Hence, when Saadi says in the 13th century, All Adam's sons are limbs of one another, each of the self-same substance as his brothers. So, while one member suffers ache and grief, the other members cannot win relief. Thou, who are heedless of thy brother's pain, it is not right at all to name thee man. Gulistan translated Brown. He means that the Sufis, though recognising its vital importance, still keep the door open for many stages of greater function for humankind. They maintain that to regard human well-being, though essential, as the highest possible, the sublime achievement of humanity, is to limit oneself so much that it is, effectively, a pessimistic and unacceptably limited stance. Again, the desire for human well-being is the minimum, not the maximum, duty of humanity. The commanding self is the origin of the individual controlled by a composite consciousness, which is a mixture of hopes and fears, of training and imagination, of emotional and other factors, which make up the person in his or her normal state, as one would ordinarily call it. It is the state of most of the people who have not undergone the clarification process. The accusing self is the state of the self when it is able to monitor its behaviour and perceive the secondary nature of so many things formerly imagined to be primary, the actual relativity of assumed absolutes, and so on. This part of the man or woman is both the check on imperfect action and also the area through which the legitimate reproach of others, or of the environment, gets through to the individual. This is the stage of ordinary conscience. Most people stop and mill around here. When the depraved or commanding self and the reproaching or accusing selves have done their work, the organ of perception and action becomes susceptible to the entry of perceptions formerly blocked. For this reason, it is termed the inspired self. In this stage come the first indications, albeit imperfect ones, of the existence and operation of a reliable higher element, force, power or communication system. Although people have often translated the word nafs, which we call self here as soul, it is in fact not such at all, but what might be called the real personality of the individual. The word for soul is ru, spirit. The so-called lower self, the nafs, passes through the stages in which it is said to die and be transformed. Since it also is held to die on physical death, the phrase for this process is dying before you die. Hence the death and rebirth cycle takes place in this life, instead of being assigned, as in the Hindu model, to supposed literal reincarnation births and deaths. Attempts to cause the self to operate out of sequence, that is, to receive perceptions when the third stage has not been reached, or to provoke and benefit from mystical experience before the fifth stage, produces the sort of confusion, and sometimes worse, which is reflected in some current literature of experimenters who choose their own sequence of events and may cause developments which they cannot handle. It also makes people crazy, or nearly so. Many of these imagine themselves to be spiritual teachers, and some of them convince others that they are too. The inner psychological problems of people who try to force developments in their psychic life are a matter for clinical, or even experimental, psychology. But there are many who stop short of this, who have not even got to the stage where they realise that their superficial interest in metaphysics bars them from something deeper, and who try exercises mechanically or spasmodically. No wonder they try to store up with emotion. Some of these are often otherwise quite nice people. They get superficial delusions because of a rationalising tendency.
is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.